Good afternoon. Uh, the reason why we circulate this uh, attendance thing is uh, for two reasons. One, uh, anybody who comes to more than half of these sessions and at the end takes an extremely difficult electronic exam, which you can take many times, uh, you'll receive a certificate from the NIH that you took part in this uh, program of demystifying medicine, which some people find to their advantage. The other is it gives us a clue as to what the audience is that we are getting to. Um, now, there are somewhere, it ranges between about 200 to 400 sometimes people in the NIH circuit who are online and watching this uh, live. So I mention that only because we encourage you to ask questions even during the talk. If you don't follow what's going on, say so. And don't hesitate to interrupt. Uh, but also in any question and discussion period, so we'll pass a microphone around. So please don't just talk quietly. Talk to the microphone, because people out there send me emails saying, what was the question? We know the answer. But you know, it's like a television program where here's the answer. What was, what was the question? So I, in thinking about this, it suddenly dawned on me yesterday that uh, the first patient with dengue I ever saw was a long, long, long time ago. Uh, I was at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and there was a middle-aged gentleman who uh, came in with something that everybody thought was flu, and then he began to complain of terrible pain uh, in his bones and in his joints. That it was more than flu. And so about that time, an infectious disease consult was called, and that was kind of interesting because the fellow who was there was a man named Shelley Wolf, whom anyone with gray hair who's been here for a while uh, knows. Shelley was uh, uh, the institute director of NIAID in later, later years. At any rate, this was a gentleman who had gotten on a plane from some Caribbean island, and he had what he thought was a cold or a touch of something. And he almost died because he eventually had this severe hemorrhagic and almost uh, total system of failure. Um, at any rate, we'll hear more about it. So uh, if, I, if you ask uh, most students and fellows, you know, what diseases kill people, particularly in the tropics, and you leave out malnutrition for a moment. Everybody says malaria and HIV. But dengue, to some extent, is a bit of an unknown. And yet it affects, as we'll learn, millions of people. Uh, it has a substantial mortality rate. And as the world gets smaller, and maybe global warming has something to do with it, I don't know, the vector the Aedes uh, mosquito maybe finds new places. At any rate, there are patients in the United States, particularly in the South, the Caribbean, Asia. There have even been a few cases, I think, reported from the Arctic, uh, how the mosquito did its thing there. At any rate, uh, I won't belabor this, but the point of the Brooklyn Bridge is that the point of this session is to connect things that we're learning or should know about major medical problems, sort of from a clinical therapeutic standpoint, and a more basic approach to mechanistic views of what these diseases are, and where do we, where do we stand in understanding how they occur. So we put all this when we can on the web, and we try to get it up a few days ahead of time. So I encourage you to come to all of the sessions, and you can see PowerPoints and everything. Just Google demystifying medicine. And when you look at it and read some of the articles that are selected, 
you come up with questions. So if I can move this, I'll show you what my questions were. Uh-oh. Ah. So I like to look up words, and it turns out that Aedes means something like odorous or nasty. It's a pretty good description. And so this mosquito uh, transmits uh, dengue, yellow fever, maybe others, but those are the only two I, I, I know. So one of the things I wondered about, why, why is it only the females who transmit the disease to humans? Uh, why are the males deprived? And how do you account for the rare occurrences that take place in places that aren't so necessarily historically linked to the tropic or subtropic? Do we have this mosquito in some water that's sitting around north of the Mason-Dixon line occasionally? And why the spectrum? Most people, like with many viral diseases, they may even be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, or they have something like the flu, or then they have this real terrible bone pain, which is what gives it the popular anachronism of breakbone fever. And then others go on and have this sometimes fatal. Why, how does that happen? What determines it? And do we have a vaccine? Uh, is the vaccine good against all the genotypes? Is that necessary? Are there antiviral drugs? Can you treat this disease if a person is that severe? What do you do? And I guess the big question from a public health standpoint is, if millions of people are affected every year, should you vaccinate them? Everybody? The world? It's difficult. So we're very fortunate to have Today, two experts uh, here at uh, NIH and Johns Hopkins uh, to discuss these uh, uh, problems and many others. Uh, these were just sort of my off the top of my head thoughts. So uh, the sp first speaker is going to be Stephen? No. No. Okay. <laughs> the first speaker is Anna. Durbin, who is an associate professor at Hopkins in the School of Public Health. Uh, prior to that, she was here in NIAID for four or five years, uh, working on uh, development and testing of vaccines uh, against dengue and other viral diseases. And before that, she went to medical school at Wayne State University and took her residency and fellowship there in infectious diseases. So uh, Anna will be the first speaker, and then she'll be followed by uh, Steve Whitehead, who received his PhD degree from the University of Oregon in biology, and then was a postdoc at Rockefeller, and then came to the NIH in NIAID, uh, and uh, he's a senior associate scientist in the lab of infectious diseases, and his main interest is the development of attenuated uh, live viruses uh, for diseases like dengue, and he's also worked on St. Louis equine encephalitis, Japanese encephalitis, uh, the big one, what's the big one? The, the West Nile virus, which we have discussed a few times here. So we're living in a changing world where infections are not strictly as limited as they used to be. They are to vectors, but I think we even ask questions now whether vectors are mutating. At any rate, we look forward to hearing your discussion. So, uh -huh. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start by asking Dr. Siddharth Mahanti to come up and sit down with me. He is um, a scientist here at the NIH 
who traveled to India a couple of years ago, and I'm just going to ask him to relay his experience upon his return from India, and then we'll go in and discuss dengue. Thanks. So you want to hear about what happened? I want to hear about what happened. The story goes back to this trip to India, which was uh, uh, part work and part uh, sort of uh, visiting relatives and so on. It was a short trip, about 10 days, but it was uh, four days in India, then five days in China, in Harbin, which is in the northeast, and then back to India for three days and back here. And um, I was fine during the tr sorry, I was fine during the, the trip. Um, the whole trip, but I do admit that I did not take malaria prophylaxis for this very quick trip where I was going to stay only in the urban areas of Delhi. And on the uh, trip, on the flight back from um, Delhi, I developed a sort of a mild to moderate headache, which was annoying, but nothing that raised any concern. And I got home and went to bed, and I woke up at about 2 in the morning with severe shaking chills and rigors. I was, and this was completely out of the blue. I had, I had no, I literally woke out of sleep with that. So I, my first thought, of course, was malaria. I hadn't taken prophylaxis. I'd gone to an endemic area. So the next morning, I came in and did a smear. And I happened to work in the parasitology uh, section. So, and there was, it, was, it was negative. So I went about my work um, and did another smear later in the day, just to be sure that I had missed the parasitemia. And by that stage, I had started feeling a bit feverish, and I developed right upper quadrant pain, and upper abdominal pain, which was getting more and more severe. Um, second smear was also negative. And so I went home, and the day, so that was day one of the illness. The day two of the illness, I woke up with starting to get some aching pains, uh, mainly around the shoulders, but also in the knees and the hips. And I, that I have seen with malaria before. So I was, I was still focused on malaria. And I uh, came back and did a third smear. And that was also negative. So I, I was, had to concede that it was not <laughs> malaria. And, but then uh, on day two, this is day two, by day three of the illness, I was getting a lot of abdominal pain. And the aching pain had become quite severe. And I sort of was, at that stage, thinking about um, dengue. And by day four of the illness, um, I noticed I had developed little red spots on, on the lower legs, on both legs. And they were moving, gradually appearing up further up, up the leg. And uh, on the end of day four, I thought I shouldn't go to get myself looked at and went to um, GW Hospital. I had checked my uh, CBC on the day, uh, one of the smear days. And uh, my platelet count was low, lower than normal, but nothing alarming. It was 130,000, normal being 150 or above. Um, but my white count was also down. And unfortunately, all of this can be seen in malaria and in a bunch of other, as I think you'll hear, uh, confusion and illnesses. But after admission, they, uh, the, the platelet count was down to 15,000, below 15,000. And they realized that this was more severe than it appeared. And the abdominal pain got worse and worse. And they did an ultrasound where they found I had uh, uh, ascites, which is fluid in the abdomen. And they were worried about bleeding as well because of low platelets. So they gave me a platelet transfusion. And that's another controversial area, which perhaps we can uh, address. And, uh, and lots of fluid replacement and so on. And I was in hospital for four days, but I turned around fairly quickly after that. So it wasn't a prolonged severe illness. But, uh, but then uh, when I got out of hospital, it took me about six weeks to really get back to my baseline. I was, the main problems were extreme fatigue, aches and pains, uh, joint pains. Um, the rash disappeared after about four days. But uh, the other symptoms kept me very, uh, how should I say, unproductive for at least <laughs> six weeks. So before I go on, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask Dr. Mahanti about his, his illness? Did you get an actual diagnosis? Of the, of the, of the yes. Um, 
I was, I'm lucky to be working at the NIH because we have a really good dengue lab. <laughs> and the blood that I drew on day two of the illness, I sent to Steve, and he grew out the, uh, the virus. Have you ever had dengue before? Not that I remember. I grew up in India, and dengue obviously transmits and is endemic in India. Uh, but maybe, uh, I don't know if you'll go over the Yeah, well, but. he likely did based on the serology that was done here at the NIH. Um, the, the ascites disappeared by the time I was I left hospital about three days after. No, they didn't give diuretics because a lot of the fluid loss is from leaking um, the capillaries, and that heals on its own. So. No, I did not. Any other questions for Dr. Mahanti? Well, thank okay. you, Siddhar. <laughs> So I've um, tried to summarize um, Dr. Mahanti's illness just very briefly, and I think he brought out some very good points. The first point that I want to make is that he became ill within two weeks of being in an endemic area, and that's very key because if it had been longer than two weeks, um, from the time he left India to the time he developed symptoms, then dengue would have been very unlikely. Um, what you can see are very classic signs and symptoms of um, dengue in his illness. So, for instance, the headache, and we often describe that as a headache that can be behind the eyes or around the eyes. Um, headache, chills, and the abdominal pain also is very key because that um, was related probably to the ascites that we had, and that's going to be a very key component when we talk about diagnosing the severity of the illness that you see. Um, originally, his platelet count, as he said, was around 140,000. However, as his illness progressed, what we see is that his platelet counts came down to 15,000, which was extremely low. He also had a low white count, although we don't have um, the exact uh, absolute neutrophil count. He had some abnormal liver functions, low platelet count, and some evidence of what we call vascular leak, which is the ascites that we saw, all very characteristic in terms of diagnosing clinically dengue. And dengue is, by and large, a clinical diagnosis. It's extremely difficult to diagnose it um, or confirm your diagnosis because you need to either recover the virus, which only specialized laboratories can do, um, or by serology, and again, only specialized laboratories do that, particularly here in the United States. If you're in an endemic area, there are some rapid diagnostic tests that have been approved for use in endemic areas but are not approved um, for use by the FDA here in the United States. This is a, a picture of Dr. Mahanti's rash. This is his rash, and what you see are little red spots here that are petechiae. Those um, are evidence of really microvascular leaking into the skin. So you're actually bleeding into the skin. This is a rash that won't blanch. It won't whiten with pressure the way another typical dengue rash does. And uh, you'll see a picture of that a little bit later. So this rash here being petechial is evidence of a bleeding manifestation or a hemorrhagic manifestation. So for Dr. Mahanti, we have clinical signs and symptoms of dengue with a low platelet count, as low as 15,000, evidence of vascular leakage based on ascites, and a bleeding manifestation based on petechiae. And all of those criteria, and we'll talk about this in a little bit later, but give him a diagnosis um, by old WHO criteria of dengue hemorrhagic fever. So he had evidence of severe dengue for which he was hospitalized. Treatment with platelets, as Dr. Mahanti mentioned, is controversial in dengue. And typically, platelets aren't given unless the platelet count is extremely low, which his was, with the concern that if somebody falls with that low a platelet count, they could have a severe bleed. So he was given a platelet transfusion. Um, what you see with that platelet transfusion is it didn't really help the platelet count all that much. It went from about 15,000 to 25,000. Um, the platelets, although they're low, they're typically normal. But because of that low platelet count, you do not want to treat somebody with dengue with drugs like Motrin or aspirin, which can affect uh, the way the platelets work. 
So really, we don't treat fevers with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Motrin or aspirin. Typically, if you're going to give something to treat the fever, you'll give acetaminophen or Tylenol. However, you do have to be concerned of liver function abnormalities while you're giving, given uh, acetaminophen. So I'm going to touch just very briefly on the history of dengue. And this is a disease that has been around clinically for quite a long time. And Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and the founder of the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, described both dengue and yellow fever in different epidemics in Philadelphia. And when you read this description, you can think of, of poor Dr. Mahanti as he returned from India. But the fever generally came on with rigor, which Dr. Mahanti described very clearly. Seldom with regular chili fit, the pains which accompanied the fever were exquisitely severe in the head, back, and limbs. The pains in the head were sometimes in the back parts of it, and at other times they occupied only the eyeballs. And that's a very classic description of dengue. Um, there are four separate genotypes of dengue, dengue 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this does complicate not only vaccine development, but it is also um, the reason why we see some people with more severe disease and some people with less severe disease, and we'll talk a little bit about it. I'll go into the immunity very briefly against dengue. It's an RNA virus, and we think that if you develop antibody against the envelope protein, that is protective. So the E protein is the protective antigen. Four serogroups of dengue. When we look at, for instance, yellow fever, there's only one serogroup. There are different serogroups of Japanese encephalitis virus um, as well. These on the top are all mosquito-borne viruses. And then, of course, as the name implies, the tick-borne encephalitis viruses are tick-borne viruses. Um, I put this slide up only so that you can basically see the structural proteins of which the envelope is one. And again, we think that that is the protective antigen. Um, these are non-structural proteins. And Dr. Whitehead's going to go into a little bit of, of detail when we talk about the vaccine. We do believe that the non-structural proteins are protective, are important for protection against reinfection with dengue, or at least in terms of viral clearance so that you don't become as ill if you're get, getting a second infection. So this is the annual burden of disease from more recent data. We think that there are about 400 million infections with dengue every year. Of those, about 100 million are symptomatic, um, present for care. And about 5% of infections we describe as severe infections. In the old terminology, dengue hemorrhagic fever or shock syndrome. When you have a dengue outbreak, what happens is um, healthcare systems are just overwhelmed. There's too many people presenting. The healthcare systems can't handle that load, and it's very difficult to get care. I think what's very interesting, what you see here, is, is we think that, that India is going to be the next really hotbed of dengue. We've recently seen introduction of dengue into Central and South America, and you'll see in just a minute, how that's affected the number of cases of dengue that occur annually. Um, this is a very important point. Each serotype confers protection against that individual serotype, but it does not confer long-term protection against the other three serotypes. And that means if you've had one dengue infection, for instance, with a dengue 1 virus, you can still be infected with dengue 2, dengue 3, or dengue 4. And not only does it not provide protection against the other three serotypes. It actually sets you up for more severe disease if you are subsequently infected with a different serotype. And we'll go through why that is in just a minute. So this is the uh, transmissibility cycle. The epidemic cycle is really an urban cycle where you have lots of people who are living close together. And the mosquito can go from mosquito to humans to mosquitoes. These mosquitoes don't travel far, maybe 100 yards or so. And to get um, to Dr. Arias's point, the reason that only the female transmits dengue is because only the female takes a blood meal. It's only the female who lays eggs. That's why she needs a blood meal, is to feed those eggs. So only female mosquitoes transmit dengue. You can transmit dengue within the mosquito to the egg. So there is some vertical transmission for at least two to three generations of dengue, which may also aid in, in the transmissibility cycle. There is a jungle cycle of dengue where uh, different mosquitoes in the jungle can transmit it to non-human primates. What's interesting is non-human primates don't really become ill with dengue. They're fairly asymptomatic, unlike humans, and unlike yellow fever virus, which can kill non-human primates. We do think that 
that uh, there are some sylvatic dengue viruses that can infect people. Um, however, the, the vast majority of the burden of illness is in this urban cycle, where you're looking at cities where there's large populations of people um, who are susceptible to dengue infection. The reason, one of the reasons we've seen such a re, um, resurgence of dengue is the fact that the vector itself has been able to repopulate areas of Latin America. So there was a large mosquito eradication campaign in Latin America to try to get rid of yellow fever and um, malaria. And it was quite successful in eradicating the Aedes aegypti mosquito from South America and Central America for the most part. Those programs ended in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And what we see is that the vector itself has been able to re-inhabit areas where it was once eradicated. And with the vector, we have the means to transmit the virus. So that's one of the reasons we've seen a resurgence of dengue. Um, there's the decline in the vector eradication program is probably the, the largest reason. We think that um, certainly global warming may, in fact, um, play a role in this. Uncontrolled urbanization provides breeding grounds for mosquitoes. The Aedes aegypti mosquito requires extremely little water in order to lay its eggs. The amount of water can just fill, for instance, a soda bottle cap, so you don't need a lot of water. Um, old tires, uh, plants that are heavily watered, all of those provide good areas for mosquito breeding and allows, um, once the vector is there, uh, allows transmission uh, of the virus. We have increased world travel by airplane. Dr. Mahanti felt well when he left India, and then by the time he came back uh, to DC, he was feeling unwell. So that virus can be brought into the United States or other areas of the world if the vector's there, if the temperature's right. When you bring dengue in, it can spread pretty easily. This is a term that we use. Um, I think it's an important term to know, hyperendemicity. It's when multiple serotypes are circulating at the same time. And that's really the setup for causing severe disease in people. You need multiple serotypes circulating so that you can have sequential infections with the different serotypes. When we look at the resurgence of dengue, this really is key. This is from WHO data looking at uh, the number of cases of dengue hemorrhagic fever, shock syndrome, and death. And what you can see is a steady increase uh, from the 1970s onward. Much of this increase through the 90s and uh, the 2000s is due to the resurgence of dengue in Latin America, in Central and South America. We're also seeing more and more cases now coming out of India, and we think that these numbers are just uh, going to increase more and more. So this is just an example of the data from Latin America. Um, in red is dengue, in blue is dengue hemorrhagic fever, and there's a couple of points that I want to make on this slide. One. In 2002, Dengue 3 was introduced into Brazil or into South America. And that's really where we saw an increase. But if you look at the number of cases of Dengue hemorrhagic fever to the number of cases of Dengue, what we see over time is this, this um, ratio of hemorrhagic fever to Dengue increases. And the reason for that, again, is hyperendemicity. We see different serotypes being introduced over this period of time. So here we had. Um, in 2002, we had Dengue 3 come in. In 2010, we had Dengue 4. And in here, we had a Dengue 2 uh, virus circulating. So we have multiple viruses circulating. And with this, you get more cases of hemorrhagic fever associated with that. Here are some of the outbreaks. Again, the point of this slide is really to show that although in some of these outbreaks, for instance, in Brazil, we have similar numbers of cases of Dengue, what we see are increasing numbers of severe dengue or dengue hemorrhagic fever and death. And that's because we have multiple serotypes circulating at the same time. This was the, um, the outbreak in India in 2012. Uh, the dengue 2 serotype, I don't think I mentioned, was dengue 2. And that is the, the serotype that was recovered uh, from Dr. Mahanti. So this was an article that appeared in 2008 in JAMA. It was written by um, Tony Fauci and David Morenz from the NIH. And it was looking at dengue and dengue hemorrhagic fever as a potential threat to the US based on cases that have been reported along the uh, Texas-Mexico border. Also looking at, for instance, uh, the, the reemergence of the vector in uh, the United States. We had Aedes aegypti um, up the coast um, to about uh, the mid-Atlantic states. We have Aedes albopictus around here, which is a related vector that is capable of transmitting dengue. 
And then what we see in 2010, we've seen locally acquired dengue in the Florida Keys. And there have been cases of locally acquired dengue out of Florida every year since 2010. So we certainly have the right environment um, in terms of vector, temperature, humidity for transmission of dengue. And we're starting to see this in Florida. So when we look at the illness, dengue can range from asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic to really a very severe incapacitating illness. It's easily confused with a lot of other illnesses, as Siddharth said, malaria, for instance, even influenza, measles, different rickettsial diseases can all sort of look the same and can be confused with dengue, or dengue can be confused with them. The more severe um, forms of the disease used to be called dengue hemorrhagic fever shock syndrome. There's been a new classification system by WHO, which we'll touch on. But I use terms of severe dengue, dengue hemorrhagic fever shock syndrome really interchangeably because you'll see both terms in the literature. The mortality rate can range from quite low, 0.2%, if you present to a place that knows how to treat dengue. So if you go into Ho Chi Minh City and happen to get dengue and present to hospital, they will take very good care of you. If you go into rural Montana having flown, say, from Thailand, you may not do so well. Um, you want to go to a place that knows dengue and knows how to treat dengue because fluid management is really key to the proper uh, management of dengue. As I said earlier, it's only a small percentage of cases that result in severe disease, but it is a significant number and can really um, overwhelm healthcare systems in affected areas. We used to say that classic dengue fever was generally a disease of adults. This was, um, it's a disease really of your first presentation. And so before we had all four serotypes circulating in many different areas of the world, um, people would present with classic dengue fever. If you're a traveler from the United States on your first trip to an endemic area such as Southeast Asia, um, <clears throat> excuse me, South America, you may get classic dengue fever, which really is what the description or the, um, by Dr. Benjamin Rush really described very well. Hemorrhagic fever shock syndrome occurs most commonly with your second infection. And that's really key, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, we see it in hyperendemic areas, generally in children younger than 15 years of age, because they've been exposed to multiple serotypes by the time they're 15. It really occurs in areas that are hyperendemic for dengue. So this is what we call classic dengue fever. It's an acute febrile illness. You have a frontal headache, pain behind the eyes, severe muscle and joint pain, which is where it gets the name breakbone fever, a very typical rash, low white count, and low platelet counts. Those are all very uh, classic. If you look at this slide, on the left, we have dengue fever going down to hemorrhagic fever going down to shock syndrome. So this is severity of disease going down. And then we have days post-infection going across. And what you can see is early on, you have viremia. Um, Dr. Mahanti's virus was recovered from day two of illness. That's really um, where you're starting to see viremia, and you can see peak virus titers. We think that peak virus titer correlates with severity of disease. So the more virus you have, the sicker you're going to be. We don't really know how that high virus titer relates to the vascular leak syndrome, though that causes shock, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So here you have a fever, which is called a saddleback fever. It looks like you're getting better. Your fever's going down, and then you go back up again. Um, here you have headache and pain. The rash is up here. It can last as long as two weeks. What's very interesting is shock syndrome, hemorrhagic fever shock syndrome, appears to occur at the point of defervescence, when your fever breaks. So you think your patient is getting better, and then they go into shock. It's a very rapid vascular leak syndrome, and I'll show you pictures of, of how, that, um, how that manifests. So dengue hemorrhagic fever, classically, um, that was uh, an epidemiological diagnosis. And in order to have hemorrhagic fever, you had to have a clinical diagnosis of dengue fever. And you had to have hemorrhagic phenomenon, like the petechiae that I showed earlier for Dr. Mahante. You have to have evidence of vascular leak, either by hemoconcentration or by pleural effusion or by ascites. You have to have some evidence of vascular leak. And you have to have thrombocytopenia. In order to have dengue shock syndrome, you had to have dengue hemorrhagic fever 
plus shock, which typically is, is um, manifested by narrowing of the pulse pressure. People go into shock not because they're bleeding out. People go into shock because all of their intravascular fluid is leaking out into the pleural cavity, into the stomach, around the liver, and they can't maintain their blood pressure. This is a typical or a classic dengue rash. What you can see is it it's, looks like a very bad sunburn. It blanches if you apply pressure with the hand and then release it. It goes white. It is extremely uncomfortable. People describe it as their skin being on fire or very, very itchy. It's a very uncomfortable rash. Um, this is what we call the convalescent rash, where you see little islands of sparing here. And at this phase of the rash, you can actually have the skin peeling off the hands and the feet. Um, it's a very, uh, very pronounced effect. So these, again, are the old WHO criteria. And I'll, I'll tell you why the criteria were changed. But in order to have dengue hemorrhagic fever, you had to have dengue plus minor or major bleeding, a platelet count less than 100,000, and evidence of plasma leakage. In order to have dengue shock syndrome, you had to have all the features of hemorrhagic fever plus evidence of shock, cardiovascular compromise. If you went into shock, but your platelet count was higher than 120,000, you did not have dengue hemorrhagic fever. Therefore, you did not have dengue shock syndrome. And so for that reason, um, there was concern about how these, um, you know, that extremely ill people weren't meeting the case definition. So the criteria were revised. However, the new criteria are more triage criteria, and they aren't very useful for epidemiological purposes. So you have different groups. Different. You could be group A, group B, group C. Group A, you're able to eat and drink fluids. You don't have evidence of vascular leak or low platelet count. You can be sent home. Group B is referred for hospital management. And that is, you have warning signs, which I'll go through. And you'll see these warning signs are really quite general. Or you have a co existing morbidity or a coexisting condition that could complement your, your um, illness, such as even diabetes, for instance. That's a comorbidity that would bring you into group B. Group C is what we would call severe dengue. That's where you have um, severe plasma leakage, severe hemorrhage, severe organ Im impairment, and you require emergency treatment. What happens is, you'll see um, for group B, these are warning signs. So if you have any of these, um, or laboratory warning sign that um, uh, looks like you have increasing hematocrit, which is a sign of vascular leakage, plasma leakage, or a rapid decrease in platelet count, you need to be hospitalized. The new criteria have resulted in really a tremendous amount of hospitalization. So again, this is very difficult for, for healthcare systems in country to manage the number of patients that are requiring hospitalization when they present with suspect dengue. These are some of the bleeding manifestations with dengue. These are little petechiae here, much like Dr. Mahanti had. This is just a large area of bleeding here. And what you see here is a blister. It's a fluid-filled blister um, from intravascular volume leaking a little bit into the skin there. This is classic, um, a classic example of vascular leak. What you see here is an x-ray where the person is placed on their side. And gravity does its work. Um, the fluid around the lung, the pleural cavity, is able to, to go down with gravity. On a chest x-ray, air is black. Things that are of higher density are white. So this is what a normal lung looks like on a chest x-ray. Here, all of this here is fluid that has seeped into the pleural cavity. You can see here the amount of fluid and understand now why people go into shock. This is liters and liters of fluid. Fluid management is key to the treatment of severe dengue. So how do you make a diagnosis of dengue? Again, it's a clinical diagnosis. You look at how the patient is presenting, and you say, I think this is dengue. You can send off tests for isolation of virus or serology. That will confirm your diagnosis. These tests take quite a while to come back. There are rapid tests in um, countries that are affected. You can do a rapid NS1 test. You can do uh, different tests that are more rapid that will confirm the diagnosis of dengue. Um, but much of these tests um, take a long time to come back. And the rapid tests are not serotype specific. So in terms 
of epidemiology saying we're having a dengue 2 outbreak or a dengue 1 outbreak. The rapid tests are not capable of distinguishing. All they will tell you is yes, no, dengue. Management of dengue, we talked a little bit about. It's really careful fluid management. And it's not anything that's high tech. What you'll see on dengue wards in these countries is there'll be a small centrifuge at the bedside. They'll come around every hour. They'll prick a finger. They'll put the blood in a capillary tube and they'll spin it down. And they'll look at the ratio of plasma on top to red cells on the bottom. And that's essentially eyeballing what the hematocrit is. And as that plasma to red cell ratio gets lower so that your hematocrit is higher, that's a bad sign and they'll give you more fluids. Um, careful fluid management is really key to successful treatment. Oftentimes with inexperienced caregivers, what happens is you give too much fluid and you actually fluid overload the person so that when the vascular leak syndrome reverses, they have no way to get rid of all of the fluid that you've given them. You want to avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents because of the antiplatelet effect. There currently is no drug that you can give specifically for dengue. You cannot give an antiviral agent that will stop the progression of dengue to severe disease or clear the viremia. There are several agents that are currently being evaluated, but there is nothing that has been shown to be effective. They've looked at steroids for the treatment of dengue and found that steroids do nothing to alter the course of disease. So steroids are, are not recommended uh, for the treatment of dengue. So why do some people get severe dengue and some people don't? And why is a second infection important? And that's what we're going to talk about right now. In studies that Scott Halstead did looking at series of cases from the Bangkok Children's Hospital, what you see in this slide is two peaks of illness. You see here a peak of DHF around nine years of age, but you also see this peak at less than one year of age, very young kids. And when he broke this down, um, into months, what he saw here is about between zero and four months, very little dengue. But between four and 10 months, you saw increasing numbers of cases of hemorrhagic fever in infants. And then that fell off between 10 and 12 months. And when they looked at maternal antibody from the, the mothers who gave birth to these babies, what they found is that maternal antibody in high titers right after birth appeared to be protective. But as that maternal antibody decayed over time, they found that it actually enhanced disease. So these titers of maternal antibody actually were correlated with more severe disease in these infants. And then as maternal antibody declined even farther, what they saw is that it had no effect. It was neither protective nor was it enhancing. So here with high titers of maternal antibody, they could show protection against dengue, but in, in titers between about, um, as they decayed between four and 10 months of age, that antibody actually seemed to correlate with more severe disease. Why is that? Well, we think that it's what we call enhancing antibody. And in secondary infections, we know that your secondary infection, you're about 15 times more likely to have DHF with a second infection than you are with the first infection. And you're about 50 to 100 times more likely to have shock syndrome with your second infection compared with your first infection. And we think that enhancing antibody has a lot to do with that. How does it work? Well, enhancing antibody, what we think is happening is that pre-existing cross-reactive antibodies from your first dengue infection can bind to the virus of your second different dengue infection without neutralizing that virus. And not only does it not neutralize the virus, but it allows the virus to enter monocytes and macrophages via the FC receptor and when the virus enters through that pathway, it doesn't trigger the innate immune response within that cell, and the virus can uh, replicate to higher titers. So if we look at it here, we're going to say that, that you had a dengue 1 infection before, so you have dengue 1 antibodies circulating here, and now you're being infected with dengue 2. That dengue 1 antibody can bind the dengue 2 virus, but it doesn't neutralize it. It acts almost as a chaperone. And then that antibody virus complex can bind to the FC gamma receptor here on monocytes or macrophages and allow, again, allow the virus to enter the cell without triggering the innate immune response within the cell. That virus can then replicate within the monocyte and macrophage, leading to higher titers of virus, which then are released. And you get a higher viral load. And we know from different epidemiological studies that a higher virus titer 
seems to correlate with more severe disease. So how do you prevent dengue? Well, today, January 13th, 2015, you wear long pants, you wear long shirts, you, you use DEET, you prevent, um, you try to prevent being bitten by mosquitoes. There is no licensed vaccine to date for dengue. Um, there's dengue vaccine development, which is ongoing, which Dr. Whitehead is going to go over and is very exciting. The very big key to dengue vaccine development, however, is that any dengue vaccine has to be protective against all four serotypes. Otherwise, we run the risk of putting people at risk for more severe disease down the road if they are infected with one of the serotypes that the vaccine does not protect against. So it is a very high bar. There are a lot of hurdles to dengue vaccine development. Dr. Whitehead's going to go over some of those in his talk. Um, and we are now going to move on to dengue vaccine development. Unless you have questions for me. I'm happy to ask while I oop, turn over the microphone. Uh, there was a similar disease developing in the Caribbean with a long African name. Chikungunya. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, how do you differentiate that? Is it easy? It, it is not easy. The key difference between chikungunya and dengue is that with chikungunya, you actually get arthritis. You can have joint swelling and tenderness. In dengue, you have joint pain, but you have no synovitis. You have no synovitis. So that is a way that you can distinguish dengue. The rash in chikungunya is not as frequent as seen in dengue, and that's another distinguishing feature. The vector is the same still? The vector is the same. It can be very long-lived. It can be months to years. So we've used, um, and, and Steve may touch on this a little bit, we've used non-human primates extensively in vaccine development because they do support viral replication. So we look for, reduct we, we look for our vaccine to prevent viral replication and non-human primates is one of uh, the criteria before we move into humans. The mosquito, multiple serotypes have been recovered from different mosquitoes. We know from our vaccine studies that when we give a tetravalent vaccine, we can recover more than one serotype from our vaccinees. It's uncommon to recover more than one serotype in people who are ill. That's probably because what you see in epidemics is that there's dominant serotypes. So um, dengue, too, will dominate. So the mosquitoes may not be carrying more than one serotype. And then that serotype's able to sort of outcompete the other one. <laughs> Yeah. The problem is it will dominate. One serotype may dominate for a year, but the next year another serotype is going to come in. So it, it's a very short-lived um, very short-lived um, response that could actually be harmful down the road. You, you'll see some graphs that, that, that show what the, what the types were across several years. Oh. Can I ask a question? So if, uh, <clears throat> what do you anticipate the effects of, can one predict the effects of global warming in terms of distribution of the mosquito, given, say, what's happened over that interval that you showed? What are the predictions as to what is likely to uh, happen? And I'm curious, are there any other disease, uh, mosquito-transmitted diseases where it's only the female that transmits? It's malaria. It's, so male mosquitoes tend not to take blood meals. So they don't transmit disease, even with um, malaria, chick, dengue. They just, even tick-borne diseases, it's the female that needs the blood meal. And so it's the female that bites. But yeah, the male mosquitoes tend not. It's, it's all the women. Um, so with global warming, I think we don't have firm predictions. What we do know is that mosquitoes, for instance, and the viruses um, prefer temp certain temperature ranges, and they prefer different humidities. So there are some models that take global warming into effect and 
think that that's going to spread the vector, certainly. So the vector will inhibit new areas where uh, the humidity and the temperature are favorable for that vector. And so there are some models that show increasing spread of different mosquito-borne diseases based on global warming. But I, but I certainly think that urbanization outpaces yeah. the effect of global warming. Global warming is going to be a very long-term thing. So as a drop in the bucket at this point, urbanization is what's, what's causing most of the problem. Thank you, Anna. Wow, we need a vaccine, right? <laughs> you killed it, Anna. Oh, do I go? Oh, it's just very slow. OK, when, when we develop a vaccine there are for dengue, there are certain considerations that we need to take into account. And uh, Dr. Gerben hit on, we need a vaccine for four different serotypes. Uh, an effective vaccine really is going to need to protect against all four viruses. Infection with one serotype is likely to confer lifelong protection, whereas you only get this um, heterotypic short-term protection uh, to the other strains. Sequential infection with different serotypes, what we do know is that it leads to a broadly neutralizing antibody response. So if you look at all of the people here on the street in Vietnam, most of these adults are dengue immune. You have to ask the question, how did they get that way, and can we safely induce this immunity in children? And I, I love this picture because vaccination responses certainly change over time. You go back in time here, they think it's really funny <laughs> until they get closer to this point. This guy's uh, you know, <laughs> terrified. Th this is not a dengue vaccination, by the way. So can, can we safely induce this broad neutralizing antibody response uh, by vaccination? In endemic areas, as Dr. Durbin uh, alluded to, dengue immunity is mostly acquired by sequential exposure to different serotypes. We demonstrated this uh, in, in a clinical study, where we took individuals who received just a dengue 4 vaccine, and two to seven years later, we came back and gave them dengue one. So on day zero of their second uh, administration, this is what the uh, neutralizing antibody profile looked like. They still have some uh, dengue four antibody. We call this homotypic antibody. It's dengue four antibody because they had been inoculated with dengue four. Dengue one, two, and three, they've never seen. They don't have any antibody. When we gave dengue one, we see a boost in the dengue four antibody at day 42. We also see primary immunization against dengue 1. Again, this is homotypic. They now have two homotypic responses. They've seen dengue 1 and 4. They have antibody to dengue 1 and 4. But then we also see this heterotypic antibody coming up. They've never seen dengue 2. They've never seen dengue 3. But now we have antibody, uh, neutralizing antibody that we can measure against um, these viruses. So when you're living in Hanoi, driving your motorcycle, as an adult, you've probably encountered two different dengues in your life. You may or may not have been sick. Most people are asymptomatic. But as an adult, you have a, a profile that's similar to this. You, you're, have, you're protected. You're not going to get dengue. As he reminds us, dengue immunity acquired by sequential infection is not without its problems. And most of the problem is the interval between infections. Because during this interval, you have this possibility of enhanced disease, which I think uh, Dr. Durbin explained very well. Um, we talked about this. There is no established correlate of protection against dengue virus. Is it neutralizing antibodies? We think it is. Is it T cell immunity? Probably. Is it both? Most likely. There's no usable animal model for dengue disease. As we mentioned, you can use uh, uh, primarily rhesus monkeys. You can infect them, they get a, a viral load, they get immunity, but they don't get disease. So we can, we can use this, these viral loads to determine how um, pathogenic a dengue virus is. 
how attenuated a vaccine candidate is. And previously, there's been no human challenge model to test vaccine efficacy. After laboratory infectious disease, why did we decide to develop a live attenuated dengue vaccine? It's worked for other flaviviruses, yellow fever virus and JE. There are live attenuated viruses for these, uh, vac viral vaccines for these viruses. They work pretty well. Uh, live attenuated viruses induce both a humoral and cellular immune response. The viruses are in their native form. They present epitopes in their native conformation. You get lifelong immunity. Once you've been vaccinated against yellow fever, you, you essentially have lifelong immunity against yellow fever. You are recommended to get a boost every 10 years if you're not living in a, an, an endemic area, but it, it is essentially lifelong. They're very inexpensive to produce. Live attenuated viruses are cheap, okay? You could grow up a liter of virus. In our case, that's a million doses of, of vaccine. They're highly immunogenic. They generally require only one dose. If you look at other live attenuated vaccines that are on the market, mumps, measles, rubella, the MMR, JE, yellow fever, these others, most of them are given as a single dose. There are some live attenuated viruses uh, such as flu in some cases, polio virus, rotavirus, where you give multiple doses. These are all administered mucosally rather than injected. And so I think the issue here is you need to make sure you are inf uh, in infecting this mucosal surface. When you inject it into the arm, you're going to infect all that virus is, is, is um, uh, delivered systemically. This is an important concept uh, that, that, that we'll talk about uh, 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 further with the dengue vaccine. What's in the current dengue virus vaccine pipeline? There are, there are, are three uh, live attenuated uh, vaccines that are being tested. The leader in the field is uh, a vaccine that was developed here at Acambus, uh, has been licensed to Santa Fe. It has completed efficacy trials in Asia and the Americas. This vaccine is a chimeric vaccine Part of it's yellow fever, part of it's dengue. So and this is a, a, a diagram of the genome. The structural proteins, pre, M, and E, are derived from dengue viruses. All the rest of the proteins are derived from yellow fever vaccine virus. So it's part yellow fever vaccine virus, part dengue. You make four different varieties of this. One has dengue 1, one has dengue 2, dengue 3, dengue 4, substituted for the pre, M, and E. You can also make chimeras where you use the, uh, a dengue virus backbone, and then you just exchange the pre-M and E for the different serotypes. And that is, that is the uh, strategy that's used uh, from a vaccine that was developed at the CDC, licensed in Virgin, and, and, and lately picked up by Takeda in Japan. And then our vaccine, which I'll, I'll describe a little bit later. There are inactivated subunit vaccines. One of them is developed by Hawaii Biotech, purchased by Merck, in which you just make the E protein itself in, in the insect culture. It's a subunit vaccine. It contains four components, one for each serotype. This has gone through a phase one uh, tetravalent uh, vaccine trial using Iscomatrix adjuvant. For subunit vaccines, you generally need some kind of adjuvant along with a lot of, uh, of virus. This has given us three doses. The results are pending. It, 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 was, it was fairly immunogenic. There are some issues, I think, with the um, adjuvant that they need to work out. There, uh, Walter Reed, uh, across town here, licensed the vaccine to GSK, which is an inactivated vaccine. There are inactivated vaccines for other flaviviruses, such as Japanese encephalitis and tick-borne encephalitis. They work. These are one serotype, though. You have to remember that. It becomes very complex to make inactivated vaccines for four serotypes. So you've got to make a dengue 1, a dengue 2, a dengue 3, and a dengue 4 inactivated vaccine, which are expensive to produce. You combine them together. They did a phase 1 tetravalent with uh, GSK adjuvants in the US and Puerto Rico. And they had a tetravalent response. And when we say tetravalent response, we mean they have antibodies to dengue 1, dengue 2, dengue 3, dengue 4 all together in uh, 90 to 100 percent of their subjects. All of these subjects were um, dengue naive. They never had any dengue exposure. 
the National Navy Medical Center across the street uh, for many years has worked to develop a DNA vaccine where they um, vaccinate you with a, a, a DNA construct which expresses the E protein. Uh, again, it's four different components. They did a phase one. They actually had a fairly low rate of seroconversion, about 42%. They are working on improvements to this, to this uh, platform. I'll spend a couple minutes talking about the Santa Fe efficacy trials because there's some things to be learned from these uh, trials. They did a trial in Thailand, a trial in uh, a phase three trial in Southeast Asia, and a trial in the Americas. You can see the overall efficacy was 30%, 57%, or 61%. If you look at the efficacy by serotype, it becomes very apparent. This is thing you one, two, three, four. This is, this is uh, efficacy. The efficacy in Thailand was 9% for Dengue 2. It's also the lowest in the Americas, uh, in, in the rest of Asia, also the lowest in the Americas. Dengue 2, as it turns out, is their, pretty much their Achilles heel for this vaccine. But, you know, it will have a public health impact. You have, you know, 70%, 80% reduction in hospitalization. The studies were not powered to de actually determine uh, this efficacy, but when you do the analysis, this is what you, this is what you see. Um, also, this vaccine is given as three doses, one at day zero, six months, and 12 months. You do see efficacy immediately after the first dose. So uh, here, month zero is when you get the first dose, then there's another dose at six months, another dose is uh, 12 months. When you look at the incidence of virally confirmed dengue, you look between the control group and the vaccine group, you see an efficacy. And that efficacy is immediately after um, the first dose. It begins after the first dose, and it continues for about 24 months. That's, that's as far as their analysis had gone when they published this paper. That's all the good news. Some of the bad news is in the supplement to the paper. When you, when you look at dengue serostatus of volunteers entering the study, you can divide it between those who have, have been exposed to uh, dengue and those who are still seronegative. This was done in 9 to 16 year olds. Some of these had encountered dengue, some of them had not in their life. When you now look at what the vaccine efficacy is, if you're dengue, I'm going to call it dengue primed, you have 84% efficacy with this vaccine. If you're seronegative, you only have 43%. This was not a statistically significant uh, level of efficacy. Um, what this tells us is that really you need Mother Nature to intervene. Mother Nature provides the first dose, and the Santa Fe vaccine, the live attenuated vaccine, is the second dose, or the third dose, or the fourth dose. When you look at their data in seropositive individuals, you probably don't need all three doses. You could probably get by with one or two doses. But for their efficacy trial, they went with three doses, as they had studied in their phase one and two studies. Uh, the other interesting piece of data is when you look at efficacy in different countries, uh, it's different. So here in Brazil, the vaccine efficacy was 78%, but in Mexico, it's 31%. Why is this? I'll tell you if, you, if you look at the number of cases by serotype, you can see that during this study, mostly Dengue 4 cases were seen. Dengue 4 was replicating in Brazil. This would seem to indicate, hey, maybe this vaccine is better for Dengue 4 than it is for Dengue 1 and Dengue 2, which was circulating in Mexico during the trial. Also, you'll notice when you have a baseline seropositivity, those that are a little bit higher tend to have higher uh, efficacy versus those that are a little bit lower tend to have the lower efficacy. Why does the circulating serotype matter in these trials? I need to explain uh, some of the early studies of the Santa Fe vaccine. When you give one dose of this vaccine to Flavi-naive individuals, people never seen a Flavi virus, you get mostly a Dengue 4 response. This is two different trials. One was done in the US, 
One was done in Mexico, Colombia, Honduras, and Puerto Rico. Dengue 4 dominates. The CYD vaccine is principally a Dengue 4 vaccine. It works in seropositive individuals because they've already been primed to the other serotypes. Like I said, when you give a sequential, a back, a sequential um, infection with Dengue, you get this broad neutralizing antibody response. That's probably what's going on here because it's, it's basically a, a Dengue 4 vaccine. In naive individuals, when you give repeat doses two and three, you start to see the other serotypes coming up. But Dengue 4 comes up earlier, you don't boost it, and it remains uh, throughout uh, the vaccinations. So the Dengue 1, 2, and 3 responses increase after subsequent doses. Here's the important part. In Brazil, in 2012 and 2013, when the vaccine was tested, it was mostly Dengue 4 uh, that was circulating. Prior to uh, 2011, you saw very little Dengue 4. It was principally Dengue 3, which was at, uh, along this timeline was replaced with Dengue 1 and 2. Then Dengue 4 was introduced. Yes, so you could have a great Dengue 4 vaccine for a couple of years in, in Brazil to answer your question. So it, work, it works well against Dengue 4. Dengue 4 was circulating. You vaccinate with what is principally a Dengue 4 vaccine. You see good efficacy. What happened in Mexico? There's no Dengue 4 in Mexico. There's only Dengue 1 and 2 circulating in 2012, 2013. The vaccine does not work very well. Dengue 2 is the Achilles heel. Doesn't, it works uh, a little bit against Dengue 1. You have lower efficacy in Mexico. You go back, you know, in, in 2014, we've already seen a, a great replacement of the serotypes with Dengue 1. So that, that, will, that would explain why does a circulating serotype matter and why do you see different efficacies in, in, in different environments. I think I've covered most of these points. Um, when they actually have a, that vaccine has a fairly low rate of seroconversion in dengue naive individuals. Three doses provides a tetravalent respo response in about 78. So you have uh, many individuals who just have a partial immunity even after three doses of this vaccine. Also, the CD8 T cell response is directed against uh, yellow fever non-structural proteins because they're backbone of this virus, the non-structural proteins, which are great um, where the epitopes for T cells are found, are yellow fever. They get a great yellow fever T cell response, but we don't think it's really that cross-reactive with dengue. That, that is under a lot of scrutiny in, uh, at this point. The other vaccine, Takeda, I just have just a couple minutes, um, is a dengue 2 backbone. In the trials described here, they gave two doses, zero in three months. They gave a low dose. This is the log of each component that's given. And they gave it subcutaneous and intradermally. When you give it subcutaneously after two doses, you see a tetravalent seroconversion in 58 or 47% of the individuals. You give it intradermally using this device, the single-use PharmaJet device, you see about 70%. I think they're going to suffer from the same problem. Their vaccine is a reciprocal of the Sanofi vaccine. They have a very strong Dengue 2 response, very marginal Dengue uh, 4 response after a single dose. What about the NIH vaccine? We also a live vaccine. We have a, a component that is all Dengue 1, all Dengue 3, all Dengue 4, and then we have a chimeric based on our Dengue 4 backbone for Dengue 2. We took a lot, hundreds of vaccine constructs. We tested them in monkeys. Then we did uh, studies in, uh, uh, phase one studies in about 700 subjects to try to pick a good component to go into what would eventually be a tetravalent formulation. The names aren't necessarily important, but you'll notice each of them has this Delta 30 designation. The vaccine has a 30 nucleotide deletion in the 3' UTR, Dengue 3 has a little bit more of a deletion. But these are, the, these are the vaccine candidates that are grown individually, combined into a tetravalent vaccine. There's two formulations, TV003, TV005. They only differ by the potency of the Dengue 2 component. 
We essentially performed all of these studies in Baltimore, Dr. Durbin, and in Burlington, Vermont, in seronegative individuals. That's what we have in the U.S. But these were safety studies. Uh, we have a clinical, the, a single subcutaneous administration of the tetravalent vaccine. We have a clinical follow-up for 16 days. Then we collect serum on days 28, 42, or we have an expanded schedule, 28, 56, and 90. Why, why did we need to increase the Dengue 2 component? Well, we gave it initially. This is a percent of individuals that serum converted to Dengue 1, 2, 3, and 4. We saw that Dengue 2 was a little bit low. We thought if we increase the potency in the vaccine, we might be able to uh, uh, increase that number. We saw only a marginal increase. But this was when we evaluated serum on days 28 and 42. What we discovered is when we use this expanded number of days, that's what this E stands for, even with TB003, where we gave three logs of each virus, we saw a, a pretty significant increase in Dengue 2. When we increase the number of days of monitoring and we increase the potency of the Dengue 2 component, now we have what we think is a very even, well-balanced Dengue vaccine. Looks different from the Takeda vaccine or from the Santa Fe vaccine because we really don't have uh, too much of a dominating uh, response here. Dengue 4, again, is, is maybe a little bit higher uh, in, in our vaccine. When we, when we used TB003 in our expanded schedule, we had 74% tetravalent response after one dose. When we used TB005, we are now up to 90% seroconversion to all four serotypes after a single dose. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to go over all of this. The clinical summary is some of the adverse events of the vaccine. Really, rash is all we see. There's a lot of talk about the rash from the NIH vaccine. Okay? About a little more than half of the individuals have a rash after vaccination. This is what the rash looks like. It's a macular papular rash. This is the chest of a volunteer, a chest of another volunteer. These very small red spots. It's asymptomatic. It's not itchy. The volunteers don't complain about it. The volunteers don't even notice it. You ask them to have a rash, they say, no. We do the physical exam, remove their shirt. Sure enough, Dr. Durbin, the eagle-eyed clinician, says, oh, wait, you, you have a bit of a rash. So this is marked as a rash. This is a rash we're talking about. It's not the typical dengue rash. So we call this a vaccine-associated rash rather than a wild-type dengue rash. Is a rash a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Oh, go ahead. Yes. And I'll show you. Oh, I took that data out. It, it, it's about 10 days. So it comes on after about 10 days of vaccination, and then it lasts maybe for about 10 days in general. But it, it, it comes and goes kind of silently. Okay, when we look at all of our vaccinees and we look at those who have rash, 61%, those with no rash, 39%, if you have a rash, you're gonna have a tetravalent seroconversion, most likely. If you don't have a rash, yes, you can still have a tetravalent response, but some people have a trivalent or a bivalent response. A vaccine is statistically more likely to have a tetravalent antibody response if they present with a vaccine-associated rash. It's significant. I call it the happy rash, okay? People think this is a, a, an odd term, but it really is uh, associated with a tetravalent seroconversion. There are other vaccines with rash side effects. This is not novel to our dengue vaccine. The MMR, varicella zoster, yellow fever, chappies, and cephalitis, they all have a, a mild rash as a side effect probably only in one, two, three, four percent of vaccinees. We have it in 50 percent, but it's not uncommon uh, among other, other uh, live attenuated viruses, vaccines. Uh, let's skip this. One dose or two doses, how many doses of this vaccine do we need to give? I put it all here on one slide. So here, here's TB005, our, our best formulation, given as two doses, six months apart. Then we looked at neutralizing antibodies 90 days post-vaccination. So here's dose one. In this case, we had a very high seroconversion to each of the um, four dengue serotypes. When we gave dose two, we saw about the same. There's, there's not much room for improvement here. 
So we, we, don't, we don't see a lot of improvement here. We see neutralizing antibodies after the first dose. And, th and this is 90 days after the first dose. When we wait six months after the first dose, at the time we're going to give the second dose, this is what the antibodies look like. This is the antibody level. It does go down. This happens in every vaccine. You have a peak, you come down to a baseline level. When we give the second dose, we don't see much of a boost in these antibody titers. In fact, we, we don't see more than a twofold boost. This is what we do see, though. At the second dose, we see no viremia, no rash. Whereas when we looked at the first dose, we had viremia, the virus is replicating, we had rash. Near sterilizing immunity at six months post-vaccination equals a minimal antibody boost. This is a live vaccine. If you give a live vaccine in tandem, if you had a good response at your primary vaccination point, you should neutralize all of the vaccine virus, at least. Okay? If you're not neutralizing the vaccine virus, how on earth are you going to neutralize a wild type virus. That's why most live attenuated vaccines are given as a single dose, because the second dose doesn't do anything because your immune response neutralizes the vaccine. It's live, it has to replicate. Could I boost these antibody titers with an inactivated vaccine? Probably, because you don't need replication. There are, that's called a prime boost strategy. There are some people who are investigating this uh, in, in the dengue vaccine field. So if you compare the, the three vaccines, I, I feel like I use car salesman, but I, I, what, my, my purpose here is I wanted to see what was happening with the other vaccines and are we going to encounter this same uh, issue. I wanted to know that before we spend a lot of money on, or other companies spend a lot of money on their um, efficacy trials. So we're a one-dose vaccine. Uh, we see a tetravalent response in dengue naive subjects, about 90%. Our vaccine is designed to be given to naive individuals. We want to vaccinate young children. They've never been uh, exposed to dengue. You've got to have something that's going to work in naive individuals. You, in that population, you can't count on Mother Nature being there first and priming these individuals. The Sanofi vaccine will probably not work very well in naive individuals. They are looking at a, a vaccine age of at least 10 years old before you get vaccinated. So you probably come into, uh, you, you're, you're exposed to dengue prior to having uh, the vaccine. They're the only one that's in clinical phase three. The overall efficacy, as I stated, was 30, 61%. We don't know what the efficacy is gonna be for our vaccine. I'm going to only take two minutes to describe what we do know about efficacy with our vaccine, and that is derived from our dengue challenge studies. Remember, we took all of these viruses and studied them in monkeys. There was one virus that we could use, dengue 2 delta 30, which was not particularly attenuated in monkeys. We thought, maybe we can use that as a challenge strain. We had prepared it as a clinical trial material uh, for administration. Uh, it's a full like dengue 2. It's a different serotype than our vaccine. It was, it was uh, derived from a uh, Tonga outbreak in 1974. That outbreak had a much mild, uh, caused much mild, mild disease, uh, lower levels of viremia. And like I said, it was, it was less attenuated in rhesus monkeys compared with our vaccine virus here. What we did is we wanted to check the safety first. So 10 subjects received, received a 1,000 platforming units, that's how we measure the potency of dengue 2 delta 30. All 10 subjects had viremia. Eight subjects had a rash. This rash was uh, more diffuse. It was itchy. 40% uh, of the subjects had neutropenia. But no subjects had fever, elevated liver function tests, and certainly no signs of vascular leak. It was a safe virus that we could use with a clinical endpoint of rash, neutropenia, or some retroorbital pain. This is what we saw compared to the placebos. Here's the p-values. The ones here in bold are, are really the only uh, adverse events that were notable compared to the placebo. This is a rash. It looks more like the dengue rash compared to what you already saw from our uh, 
dengue vaccine rash. 100% of uh, individuals that received 2 delta 30 had a viremia. It was a higher titer, almost two logs higher, 100 times higher. It came on earlier. It lasted longer than we saw with our vaccine candidate. What we did is we took 48 subjects. Half of them received our TB003 vaccine. Half of them received the placebo. Six months later, they come back to be challenged. Our primary efficacy endpoint was viremia against the dengue 2. Our secondary efficacy endpoints were protection against rash. Again, we collected the samples as we had done in the past. When these individuals came back, um, they got challenged. Uh, then we followed them after the viral challenge. If you're a placebo, you had viremia. All of them had viremia. All of them had a virus load. This is the range uh, onset and duration. If you had been vaccinated with TB003, you had no viremia, and of course, uh, no range onset or duration. 100% protection against this virus. If you look at rash, 84% of the placebos had rash, 0% of the vaccinees had rash. TB003 provides 100% efficacy against the Dengue 2 challenge. This gives us some hope that when we introduce this in an efficacy trial, that we're actually going to see some true efficacy. We chose Dengue 2 also because, remember, Dengue 2 gave us a little bit of a problem in our early formulation. Uh, I think I've done all of that. The vaccine has been licensed by Merck here in the U.S., the Bhutan Tan Foundation in Sao Paulo, uh, Panacea Biotech in New Delhi, uh, Val Biotech in Hanoi. There's others that are interested in it. it, it it's, it's being um, uh, scaled up for manufacturing in these areas. These areas are going to have to do efficacy trials. And that's it. We made it. The seven minutes to spare. See? <laughs> Go ahead. So this is a positive sense RNA virus, and you're using PRM and E as your mostly what you what we're mm -hmm. being. How much drift do you actually see in those over the years? There's drift. Okay. But they we, we don't run in. Okay, flu people. Close yours. <laughs> you don't run into the problems you have with flu. Right. If you have been exposed to one dengue serotype, suppose you've had dengue one and then you later encounter a different genotype or, or, or a drift of dengue one, you're still going to be protected. Okay. Protection against within that serotype is good for the entire serotype. Okay, so that seems to be... So, so the, the drift and shift is, 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 not as prob is not going to be problematic. You're not going to need to update the vaccine. So it's more likely a confirmational at the tip than sequential? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, second question real quick, sorry. So in your formulation that you're using, you've deleted 30 base pairs out of the three prime untranslated region. Mm -hmm. How does that attenuate the virus? <laughs> That's a good question. We are studying that. <laughs> now, now that we have, now, now that we've developed the vaccine, we can, we can turn around and start looking at these issues. It probably has something to do with um, replication. Although, a linear virus. Yes. Yes, but it, it's all folded up. Okay. And what, what, what we think is happening is, is probably not uh, virus replication because this, the vaccine viruses in tissue culture cells, Vero, grow very well. In fact, GSK is interested in the vaccine to grow for their attenuated, their inactivated vaccine because it grows so well. What we think is that the Delta 30 mutation is reducing the replication in humans and, and the cells that the virus replicates in humans. And in monkeys, which are part human. Now, what do we know about the cell biology of dengue? In other words, how does it enter and replicate the dengue? So it's. Um, you can do this. So we think the target cells are dendritic cells, monocytes, macrophages. We know, for instance, that DC sign is a very good receptor for dengue. Um, it's not clear what, there's been different putative receptors, heparin sulfate um, and, and DC sign, 
it, we, we believe that monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells are target cells. When people have done autopsy studies, things like that, it's very, um, that's, they can find the virus in many different tissues, but it's thought to be really located to those typical cell lines and that when it enters through those particular receptors, um, it can trigger the innate immune response within the cell. We're still looking for other target cells and receptors for dengue. We really don't know what, what cell is pumping out all the virus because if you look at somebody who has dengue hemorrhagic fever, they can have a, tighter, a, a virus load of 10 to the 9. People who have dengue fever, simple dengue fever, you know, maybe 10 to the 4, 5, or 6. We don't know what cell is pumping out all that virus, and that's one of the mysteries of, of dengue. A more simple question. Uh, I was uh, surprised to see that Puerto Rico was a part of this uh, vaccination. Is, is that the problem in Puerto Rico, dengue fever? Oh, dengue is a big problem in Puerto Rico. It is a problem throughout all of the Caribbean. So what do you and that's, CDC has an entire uh, dengue branch located in Puerto Rico. Is vector control now completely hopeless with all the traveling, or what? <sighs> vector control works. Yeah, right. So you can, you, can, you can spray an area, and it will work. It's not sustainable. So you spray, you spray the hell out of a region, dengue goes away. Next year, there's no money to do the spraying, dengue comes back. Nobody has tried doing this uh, sterile males or that sort of trick. There is a lot of genetic modification to mosquitoes. That's a whole separate topic. And that does, there is some evidence that that may work. Again, how sustainable that is. When you try to, re you, it's very hard to fool Mother Nature. It's very hard to get a replacement of one mosquito, usually because when, when you do these genetic modifications, you take a hit in fitness, and even if it's a small hit over time, uh, that can be important. There are other projects where they don't see such a, a, a fitness uh, disadvantage in their modification of the mosquito. Those may work. But dengue, uh, you, you asked the question, so I'm, I'm going to give you an answer. Dengue mosquitoes and Anopheles mosquitoes were eradicated from South America by Fred Soper, okay? When they took DDT away, that all ended. So did the eagle's eggs, didn't they? Or I'm trying to remember. <laughs> so is it known if certain serotypes are carried better by the 80s species than others, and that could help explain circulating strengths? Um, that's possible. All of, the, all of the different strains, it's more of a strange issue rather than a serotype issue. There are, there are some ser uh, strains that, that do not uh, transmit as well. They don't cause as much disease in the short term, but then they get replaced with a different strain. But yeah. What, what makes it that way, we're not sure. So much of this is an IO2 phenomenon, the vascular leak. They've looked at different mediators. They think that it may be products of the complement system, so anaphylatoxins like C3A and C5A. They've looked at IL-8, I think. There's a lot of, they've looked at tumor necrosis factor alpha. They've looked at a lot of different cytokines, and there's not one that they can pinpoint to say, this is why we're seeing vascular leak. What we know is that the cells are not destroyed, that the, um, Junctions of the cells appear to be leaky, but they, they don't appear to be damaged. So it does look as though it's a chemical-mediated effect by cytokines, or as I said, anaphylatoxins, something like that, but we don't know exactly which one. There is a cytokine storm that is, that is, that is occurring. But it's fascinating that, you know, a cytokine, cytokine storm is the incriminated mechanism in many forms of other acute fulminant of disease. Hepatitis is a pretty good example of it. People have gone out inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, the whole thing. And yet here's something that is fulminant, affecting primarily the vascular system. The liver isn't terribly badly affected. I mean, 
you do see, it can be. Yeah, you do see it. most in in um, in Asia in kids who present with hemorrhagic fever. Ninety percent of them had hepatomegaly and elevated liver functions. They don't typically have fulminant hepatitis, although it can occur. Well, are there any other questions, comments? If not, thank you very, very much. Thank you. You don't have to worry today. There's no mosquitoes out there. <laughs> so listen, thank you. That was very exciting. Very okay. interesting. Thank you.